welcome, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here with me. And I want to give you an announcement first. And then we're going to talk all about tween and teens emotions. And many of you have reached out to me. And when I think about the common thread through all of the questions that I received this week, it's how do we deal with this roller coaster of emotions that our kids can feel, whatever it is that they're navigating, whether it's a dating relationship, or a breakup, it's math homework, it's anxiety and going back to school and all that's going on uh, around our kids and in their world and the, all the, the different things that they have to navigate. So how do we help them? And how do we stay calm when they have so many emotions? So it's, it's twofold, so I'm gonna talk about that. But I want to first just say to you that I am, again, doing that three-day free workshop. And thank you for those of you that gave me feedback because it was really helpful when I said, what was, what's a challenge you're having? And so I am going to do it all around. What do you do to empower your tween or teen? And I'm calling it the cost of dependency and how to raise kids to be independent. I forget exactly the, the name <laughs> I'm calling it, but it's like the cost of dependency and helping to empower them. And so each day, the first day I'm gonna talk about the common mistakes that we make. The second day, I'm gonna talk about the difference of how we empower them. And the third day, it's how do we move them towards independence and help them to be confident and resilient and responsible. And I'm gonna be talking about homework battles in there. I'm gonna be talking about how do you get your kid up for school? I mean, some specific issues that we can have. How do you motivate them when they don't seem to be very motivated? And we're gonna talk about what we can do to be influential in our kids' lives. I'm gonna talk about consequences, punishment, what works, what doesn't, setting limits and all of those things. So I'm super excited. And it is starting on Tuesday, October 5th. It's going to be at 7 p.m. Central Time. There will be a recording and a replay available for a limited time. Then Thursday, October 6th, and that, or what did I say? Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So Tuesday, I believe that is, let me see, the 5th the 6th and the 7th at 7 p.m. Central Time. So you're going to be seeing that on the page. So sign up, it's free, it's awesome. And I do a question and answer at the end. So you get real-time answers. And what's also cool about it is everything that I do, I wanna make it really personal. I wanna connect with you. I use tons of research. Um, it's all research backed. I share a lot of my own stories so that you can, you can relate and you can be like, oh my gosh, this isn't just me. I'm not, no, I'm not the only one that's going through this. And what's really cool is that other moms on the call, they type in like, oh my gosh, me too, and start engaging with each other. And so the whole experience, you hang up and you feel like, so encouraged and you feel less alone and you've got some great tools in your toolkit. But even more than that, like a deeper understanding of what is going on with your tween or teen and what they really need to thrive. And each one of you right now is watching this because you care so much about helping to support your kids and to raising them to be successful, whatever success looks like for them, right? And we all want that. And we want our kids to thrive in life. We want them to have healthy relationships. We want them to be motivated. We want them to accomplish their dreams and their goals and who they were created to be. So we want all these things. So how right now, while they're in your homes, can you facilitate that and help them? Because they are developing right now so many skills and it starts with us equipping ourselves and empowering ourselves to be able to give that to our kids. So I wanna go over to my notes right now and um, I wanna talk all about today what I really think is one of the most important foundations to our parenting and that is emotions. 
And if you would have asked me what emotions had to do with anything 20 years ago, I would have been like, seriously, we're going to talk about emotions. Like, let's cut to the chase. Let's fix this issue. Just tell me what to do. And yet that doesn't work. I'm going to have my coffee with you. That doesn't work very well with our tweens and teens. Why? Because they're full of emotions and emotions are what connect us. John Gottman, if you know John, uh, Dr. John Gottman, he is amazing. He, uh, he talks about emotional parenting. He has done a lot of research with marriages and also with kids. And he has followed kids from when they were young into adulthood. And you know who the kids were that were the most successful? When they followed them were happy, resilient, responsible, thriving in their lives. They were the kids that's parents did emotion. More than intelligence, more than IQ, more than anything, it was the parents that equipped their kids with understanding and working through their emotions. And you think about it, that makes total sense because everywhere you go, you're feeling something, whether you've shut your feelings down. If you're like me, I was just like, shut, stop those feelings. Don't let yourself feel anything because they're so uncomfortable. But you go to a job and you have to know how you're feeling in order to say no to something. Now, some of you are like me and we're people pleasers, or maybe you're a recovering people pleaser. And even being a recovering people pleaser means sometimes I fall into people pleasing still. And I did that in my jobs that I had. I did that all over the place. And once I got in touch with my anger, <laughs> you know, like that was a bad feeling growing up. Like I noticed, huh? Oh, feeling a little resentful here. That was a dashboard light for me that I needed to say no and take better care of myself. And see, so emotions point to what we need. And so when my, my oldest was a tween, I had grown up. We have to know, understand, and I'm going to share six points with you, but it really starts with understanding our emotional history. And that starts with our childhood and how emotions were treated in our childhood. How was sadness treated in your family growing up? How was anger treated? How was frustration, anxiety treated growing up? Because oftentimes the way that we, and maybe it's not even oftentimes, it's usually 100% of the time, how emotions were treated in our family growing up we bring into our parenting and we see it out of this lens of what is negative or disrespectful or what we need to shut down when it comes to our kids. And we don't, we, we mean well, but what I learned is my tween was really angry. A lot of the time she was strong-willed. And it ended up, it was very hard to parent her because again, I was compliant growing up. Anger was not okay in my family. And then I, what did I do? God gave me this gift of this kid that was really angry. But what did I try to do? What did I wanna do as a mom? And maybe you're relating to this as a mom. I wanted to shut it down. It was, it was a negative emotion and you just shut that down because I wasn't in touch with my own anger. And even seeing anger, it's not a bad emotion, but it's information. And that our kids do not know how to emotionally regulate their emotions. And so we need to be able to help them to do that. So I want to start out, I got, I just have to tell you, I got a standing desk. So I'm standing up and it's so exciting. Um, and I can raise that up and down. So I'm standing. So I, I was talking to Jen who works uh, with me for Moms of Tweens and Teens. And I'm like, I have my standing desk. And she said, I know because you're, we you're weaving. <laughs> just like going like this. So hopefully I'm not making anybody seasick um, or motion sick. Uh, anyway, okay. So why? I, I think that one of we, the starting point also is to understand what's going on inside of them. Because when my oldest was a tween, 
I didn't get it. Like, I was like, why is she acting up? Why is she angry? Why is she disrespectful? Like, you know, why? And that is bad. I mean, it was that black and white for me. Like, this is bad. These are bad behaviors. And let's just come on, you know, get with the program. I'm the boss, right? I was very punitive. And I didn't understand how normal some of these emotions are and um, that there was a reason to what she was, you know, to why she was feeling all of these emotions. Um, so here's some reasons that, that they're so emotional. And many of these, I'm grateful that you probably know these already because there's so much more information available to us now about what's going on in the adolescent brain. So their adolescent brain literally has rewired and is reconnecting. And it's in that process of rewiring. So they don't have the skills and the tools to emotionally regulate because as I've said before, if you've listened to any of my lives, I talk a lot about the adolescent brain and how the back of the brain is lit up where the amygdala is. So it's fight, flight, or freeze response. The prefrontal cortex is the reasoning part of the brain that can speak, you know, you think about when we get triggered by something and where our emotions, when we get flooded, how hard that is to emotionally regulate. And we have to access the prefrontal cortex in order to, to I have to say to myself, okay, Cheryl, you're feeling anxious right now. So what are you anxious about? Well, one of my most common ones is I'm in scarcity mode. Not enough time, I have so much to do. And then I have to say to myself with my prefrontal cortex, okay, you're in fight, you're in freeze mode, fight, flight, freeze mode. So I'm anxious, right? It's like, feels like the hair standing up on my head when I'm like that, I'm like, oh! And my prefrontal cortex, I have to access it, my non-emotional brain, and I have to say, is that really true that you don't have time today, Cheryl? Can you get that done? And then I go, yes, I can, I can make that happen. And so see, our kids don't have that. They haven't learned how to do that. It's hard for us, imagine how hard it is for them. So the adolescent brain, hormones are raging, a lot of changes going on. And, and change, I just did my podcast um, interview with Michelle Mitchell and it went live yesterday and she's amazing. We talked all about puberty and she was talking about how all the changes that are happening in their lives are uncomfortable, many of them, and they don't really talk to us about it. I remember my son saying to me, I don't want to grow up. I'm scared to grow up when he was in middle school. And he was able to articulate that, which was so awesome. But our kids are feeling that they have this increase in responsibility. And so they're feeling that as well. Friend groups change in middle school. They're trying to navigate friendships. They're trying to figure out who they are. They're trying to figure out where they belong. They're answering this question of who am I? Where do I fit? And then there's all this stuff that's going on around them. And then you add social media, you add FOMO. One mom had asked, uh, had said her sixth grader wanted a, a, the latest iPhone. And I'm thinking, hold off as long as you can because it has there has been such a spike in anxiety and depression and suicide with our kids when all of this stuff was introduced and if you if they do have cell phones and I know my daughter had a cell phone at a younger age because she was the baby in the family and I was working and you know and so safety reasons we got her a phone but make sure that you use our cell phone contract and you talk about things. Make sure that you go slow and, and watch, you know, are very diligent in watching what apps they have. And I say, hold off on Instagram till they're a little bit older and understand they're not gonna like it. They're gonna be upset because a lot of their friends are on it. But I will say as a mom of older kids now, it is worth it. It is worth it to wait because it's studies are showing that our kids are comparing themselves. It's very confusing when they're trying to figure out who they are when they're in middle school to have to be exposed to all of this. So that's just my, that's just my belief, my two cents 
uh, I know that we all have to decide what is best. But so anyway, that's added a whole nother layer. So they need help with emotionally regulating. And I'm going to give you five things that you can begin to do to lay this foundation. And remember, for those of you that jumped on, Dr. John Gottman followed kids from young ages, toddlerhood, all the way to adulthood. And what he found is more than anything else, having parents that help them navigate their emotions, help them to thrive more than anything else. Because you bring this in to every single situation when you learn how to manage your emotions and um, work through them. And also emotions are what connect us. And so when I wasn't doing anger, you know, when I was like, shut that anger down and I got married and I thought, I was just saying this in another podcast uh, with Becky Bodwin, and we were talking all about letting go of control. And it's, I just got uh, a couple of emails from moms that are like, thank you so much. And how scary it is to let go of control. And we were talking and I was saying, you know, when I got married, I thought, oh, my husband and I never fight. You know, we're so happy. But meanwhile, I was like in my bathroom praying <laughs> for him that he would change because I was I was storing up resentment and I wasn't talking about what I was hurt or angry about. And so, but I thought that if you're in a happy relationship or you're you're a happy family, then everybody's going to be pretty much happy all the time. Well, I mean, and we kind of know on one level that's not true, but I think often we want times so we want everybody to be happy and we mean well, but it's not where intimacy happens. It's not where we're going to have connection with our kids because the reality is we're not always happy, right? We have sadness, we have grief, we have loss, which so many of you and our kids have been experiencing over these, this last year and a half. It's been tough and we got to talk about it. So anyway, so number one, understand your own emotions and the beliefs behind them. So like I said, it's really good to do an inventory of how emotions were treated in your childhood growing up. Anger, not a good one in my family growing up. Um, sadness, you know, I, I was considered too sensitive. And so that's dismissive. That's what dismissive parenting is, where we dismiss them. And, and we end up doing that to our kids. Why? Because it's so uncomfortable for us when we haven't worked through our own emotions and we don't recognize our emotions. So when my daughter was angry, I got mad. I was mad. I was trying to shut them down and dismissing them. I mean, I really wasn't even dismissing them. I was getting angry where she really needed, there was a lot going on that I didn't know about. And I put that post last week talking about that where uh, we've had conversations now where there's a lot going on that she was feeling sad about, but it was coming out as anger. And if I had have known that, been more in touch with my own emotions, I would have been able to better help her to navigate through her emotions and her feelings. But it's never too late because we do that now as I have grown and done the healing work in my own life. So, so that's number one. Become aware of your own emotional history and your beliefs about emotions. Some of you, sadness might have been a bad emotion. You just, every time you cry, I see this a lot with moms I work with, when they cry, they're like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And it's like, no, you're grieving. Let it out. And those, it's, those toxic emotions can get trapped and then they come out sideways. They spill out in other ways. So that's one of the beliefs that I used to have is if I just stuff it, then it's not really there. And yet, because I was feeling angry, it was coming out passive aggressively. You know, I was feeling a lot of anger at a family member. So what would I do when there was a family function? I would come like two hours late. I think about that now, I'm like, oh my goodness. But you see, it was leaking out in more hostile ways. So we need to be aware of that as well. Number two, awaken to your feelings. 
start noticing what you're feeling. That's usually right where I start with moms. Notice, sometimes I have a journal in the inner circle, a feelings tracker where you can track your emotions. I notice I feel hurt here when my tween talks to me this way. I feel hurt, then I feel angry. Or maybe you're angry first and then you're hurt. And so we, and then what are the beliefs that you're telling yourself? And we, we attach that. I, I help to make that connection. And what is really the truth? Because so much of this we take personally with our tweens and teens, and it's really not about us. I was taking it so personally when my daughter was angry, but little did I know it had nothing to do with me. It was all the things that she was feeling that were going on that I didn't know about it. And when I was dismissing her feelings or making them bad, I wasn't a safe place for her. And our kids need us to be a safe place where they can open up. Number three, be curious about what your tween or teen is feeling and what the emotions are saying. So what do I mean by that? So it's just, that's where we have to just shut up and just slow down and just start noticing what our kids are feeling. They might relay a story and, and you can say, oh, that must have hurt. Or I can see why you would be angry. And then you don't say anything else. And if you get it wrong, and this goes for anybody in your life, if you get it wrong, they'll usually correct you. No, I wasn't feeling hurt. I was feeling angry. Huh, that makes sense. What happened? What did you do? And, and at first, I know, I know I'm know, i reading your mind. You're like, they won't tell me. I just want you to practice listening. And, and notice even facial expressions. Like I will say to my kids, or even my husband, you look sad. Our client, you look sad. Why is that so powerful? Because we're, we're seeing them. And that's what our kids need. They need us to see them. You're, I, you're angry today. Um, I'm noticing you're angry. Um, are you okay? You know, what's going on? And being curious about it rather than dismissive or getting angry back or getting into this fight and argument that they shouldn't be acting this way. So sadness is they may be lonely. They may be disappointed about something, heartbroken. And what is usually the need underneath sadness? Well, to be heard. They need us to hear. They need us to listen. They need for us not to try and fix and make them happy, to hold space. We're containers for our kids, to be a container. And that's hard to do. It's really hard to do because we want to fix it because we love our kids. And it's, again, it's that discomfort of sitting in the emotion. But I want you to think about somebody in your own life. When you are feeling something and you go to them and you say, I am struggling and they don't try to fix it, and they just sit back, and they listen to you, and they go, wow, that sounds hard. I can see why you would feel that, that way you feel. How do you feel when you leave that conversation? Well, I don't know about you, but I feel, I feel like, thank you, that somebody's not trying to fix me, that they get me, that they understand me, that they're listening to me, that I make sense, and it's the same thing with our kids. And if we're feeling sad or hurt, think about if you've been in, if you're married or maybe you're divorced, but you've had a relationship with somebody and what do you want usually when you're venting or you're talking about something hard? You just want that other person to listen and validate you. And, and we have to remember that because that is the most important thing that our kids need. It's not that we don't offer advice or give them suggestions or help them to problem solve, but we don't do that first. We wait because it's amazing. And I just want you to start trying this. And so many of you have, have reached out to me and said, thank you, thank you. I'm trying what you're telling me. And I'm blown away. Just in one time of doing it, it was a totally different conversation. And 
It is. I mean, you'll see, and you might be thinking, well, I don't know if that'll work with my kid. Just try not offering any advice and saying, huh, hmm, wow, you can just say that and see what happens. And you'll notice your kid's wall will start to come down because they're like, mom's not trying to fix me or tell me what to do or that I shouldn't have done that or that I should have studied harder. She's just listening and you'll notice slowly they'll start opening up and talking more. So anxiety. Anxiety is a perceived threat. And I know many of you have kids that are especially feeling a lot of anxiety now. And after a uh, a year of doing the remote learning and all the stress with that and then having to go back into social situations is causing a lot of stress on our kids. They have really struggled and they are still struggling. And so anxiety is a perceived threat. Or maybe you have a perfectionistic kid and they put so much pressure on themselves. So being curious about what is that anxiety needing? And a lot of times it needs a it needs just a safe place to vent and get it off their chest so they're not weighted down so much. And what happens is even if I'm feeling anxious, what's my, my knee-jerk reaction is to go, don't be anxious, don't be anxious, don't be anxious. What are you so anxious about? But that actually, any of you that do mindfulness and you meditate, it doesn't help it makes it worse when we're trying to shut the anxiety down. Why? Because we get anxious that we can't stop the anxiety. And what we need instead is to just notice it. Like a cloud going by, oh, you're anxious. That's okay. It's okay to be anxious. Normalizing that feeling makes anxiety come down. So it's like the opposite. We tell our kids, well, why are you anxious about this? This isn't a big deal. <gasps> oh my gosh, something must be wrong with me then. That happened with me as a kid. I was very anxious. I had a lot going on. I lost my dad, you know, and, and my mom was single and there's so much going on. And I started having panic attacks, which I didn't know what they were. But the more that I tried to say, I'm, I'm, I don't feel good. I, something's wrong with me. I think I'm going crazy. I used to say that. I think I'm going crazy because it was like having this this total panic attack, I thought they're gonna to have to take me away in a straitjacket. That's how powerful I felt. And, and to have it be said to me, ah, what are you anxious about? I get over it. Then I was panicking that something was really wrong with me. So let your kid talk without having to fix it. And that's where oftentimes when our kids struggle with anxiety, the apple might not fall far from the tree and we struggle with anxiety. And so that's where we have to learn how to manage our own anxiety. So we're not continually putting it on our kid and making whatever it is that's happening bigger than it needs to be. Anger. I printed this out and I can put a, a, a link. This is the anger iceberg. And I don't know if any of you have heard of this. And at the end, I will do Q&A, okay? But I love this. And this is so helpful. I work, I use this with clients and when I'm teaching classes and courses and workshops, but anger is a secondary emotion. Any of you that follow Brene Brown, who I absolutely love, she talks a lot about this in her book, um, Daring Greatly, and the uh, gift of imperfect, um, well, she has gift of imperfect parenting, but the gift of imperfection. And she talks about how anger is a secondary emotion. So when your tween or teen is yelling a lot and they're disrespectful. Now with my daughter, as I was talking, she was acting out anger in angry ways. And what was I doing? Trying to shut the, go to your room, stop it. You know, um, don't act that way, right? Not that, not that we don't have to, we have to teach them how to handle their emotions responsibly. But we want to be curious because what was really going on underneath her anger was she was sad. She was hurting. She was being left out of a group. She had some painful things going on with a boyfriend that I didn't know about. She, had, she was embarrassed about some things. She didn't know how to talk about this because our kids really don't know um, how they're feeling. Just like us, we have trouble sometimes knowing how we're feeling. 
And yet, so it comes out as anger. So if we're trying to squash the anger, all of this stuff is underneath here going on. So pay attention to the anger and try to get what's going on underneath and paying attention, giving space to that. You sound angry. What's going on? What are you angry about? And you'll notice that the more that you care and you have empathy and you're curious, the anger, your kid's anger will start to go down. It'll actually decrease. So anger also points down. A lot of times kids get angry at this age because they want what they want when they want it. And we have to say no to them and set boundaries and just know they're going to be angry. They're not going to like that. And that's okay. Normalize that. But anger also speaks to when something is, when a boundary is being crossed, when we don't like something. So if you have a kid that's saying to you, get off my back, stop bugging me with my homework, listen to them. Okay, I'm going to back off and back off and then revisit it and talk about how might I support you? Is there anything I can do to help you? Maybe get a tutor. So that's more important than just trying to shut it down and seeing it as a bad emotion. But think about there's something they're wanting and needing and something that needs attention. So number four, helping our kids to emotionally regulate, show up and seek to understand, which is just all that I talked about. And um, Daniel Siegel has a great book out with Tina, um, I always forget if it's Bryson Peyton or if it's Peyton Bryson, but anyway, called The Power of Showing Up. And I use this book when I'm teaching workshops quite a bit because um, attachment, which is a baby attaches with its mother, its father, its caregiver, right? Attachment is very important, but attachment doesn't just end a childhood. I mean, when you're an infant, attachment is always going on. And even if, um, and this is a lot of work that they do with kids that are foster kids or kids that are adopted, is attachment work. And uh, I'm not going to go into that a lot today, but attaching to our kids, again, is through their emotions, that's where our kids feeling hurt, like and a baby cries and you're like, oh, they need something, right? They might be hungry. They might um, need their diaper change. They might need comfort. And so the power of just showing up is being present. And if we're feeling anxious, or we're trying to control things, or we're all anxious, you know, we're anxious ourselves, or we're thinking about, we're fortune telling, like if they don't do their homework, they're not going to get into the college that we want them to get into, or whatever that looks like, or they're going to flunk out of high school, or whatever, and we're telling ourselves these things, we're not going to be present in the moment. So I say, moms, bring it into the here and now, whatever it is, and deal with it, and seek to understand, show up. We have to put down our phones. I am doing that all the time. Even with my husband, I'm like, okay, my brain is like, whoa, I'm way out here and I've got to bring it back. I've got to go sit down. I'm going to be, I have to say kind of like, not have to, but I want to, that's who I want to be. How's your day going today? Um, I have grandkids. I have two grandkids, one that's four, one that's six. And um, it's so cute because it's like you get this whole second chance when you've got your grandkids and, uh, and then they go home. But I'm like, what's the worst part of your day today? Oh my gosh, they love to talk about, tweens and teens too love to talk about the worst part of their day. What was your best part of your day today? Like, what was your favorite thing that went on? My granddaughter's like, art class, I loved it. I got to draw, I got to do this, I got to do that. My grandson's like, recess, you know, it was so cute. They love to tell me about their day because I ask questions. And so we just want to show up be present. Maybe your kid doesn't want to talk to you right now. And maybe you have been bombarding them with a lot of questions. And so they're like, whoa, back up, right? So just use your intuition. Maybe it's just being present with them, driving and not talking. I had to do that with my son. I said to my husband, why does he always talk to you? And he doesn't talk to me. And he's like, because I don't talk. <laughs> like, really? That works? He's like, yeah, try it. Next time you're in the car with him, about 15 minutes in, he starts talking. 
I'm like, all right, because I was always trying to get conversation out of him. And so he didn't want to talk. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's uh, counterintuitive with our tweens and teens, but then it was funny. I'm like, okay, 15 minutes, sure enough, starts talking. It was amazing. So maybe, you know, just think about, okay, do try to do one thing differently and see what happens. Number five, we have to be willing to embrace the messy. A red flag, excuse me, a red flag goes up for me when I talk to a mom and, and believe me, I'm saying this from experience in my own life, having, and I have total compassion because I was this way, like a great family is a happy family. We see all those books, how to have a happy family. And nothing's wrong with those books because we want our kids to be well-adjusted. We want them to have, you know, healthy relationships. We want them to be happy. We don't want them to be miserable. That's why we, that's why you're listening right now, right? You want to raise kids that are happy, healthy, and are thriving. However, the way to be happy (laughs) is to be able to express our emotions, those negative emotions, and get them out to free us up. And it was, um, I have been doing personal growth work for, gosh, over 16 years now. That's why I do what I do now, because of my training, because of my own personal growth journey, weekly, intensive, like, work on myself. And... um, and that is translated to my clients. It's translated into my family. And it's, it's caused so much healing in my own life and in all of my relationships. It's very powerful. And um, one of the things early on is I had to embrace the messy and be okay with the discomfort of the negative feelings and know that intimacy, when there's, when we're, have intimate relationships, there's going to be conflict. It's because why? Because we have to say, I didn't like that you just did that, mom. And I'm like, whoa, I want to get defensive, right? Don't we? We want to get defensive and say, well, I was just trying to whatever, 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 right? We get defensive or my kids would tell me something and still, I mean, this still is, goes on that they don't like. And I think we often can feel shame when somebody criticizes us when we're trying so hard to do it right. But we have to embrace the messy and to really listen. That's one of the ways that we can really show up. It's like, oh, okay, you just told me, you just told me this. Like one of the things is my daughter uh, would say, I'd go in and, hey, how you doing? And she'd be like, get out of my room. And boy, I would be like, what do you mean get out of your room, right? And we can just like lose it. And okay, I will leave. But the way that you said that, that hurt. If you could just ask me nicely, oh, I'll leave. You know, telling, you know, feelings can be messy. Conflict is messy and none of us enjoy it. And number six, understand that this is a process. Like, If you're in the process of messy, a lot of emotions, messy room, feeling a lot, your kids are feeling a lot, maybe they're they're struggling right now, you're struggling right now, come to that three day, sign up, look on the page, ask me, DM me, where's the link, I'll send it to you, come to the three day that I'm doing, then I open up the, the moms of tweens and teens inner circle, it's our membership group, which is just amazing. And you get to connect with me and I do an eight week parenting program in there. It's, it's just um, transformative. But no, this t- is a process and it's okay that it's a process and it's okay that it's uncomfortable. And that you, every single day, you're just trying to get, you're growing, you're learning, you're growing and your kids are learning and growing and too, too. And Learning and growing up, it can be a really wonderful time. And this, I mean, sometimes I talk too much about the negative. This could be a beautiful, wonderful time of cultivating and building a strong and healthy relationship with your tween or teen in your family. And it can also be come with its knocks. And it's, you know, it's hard times and it's tough times. And 
your kids are learning and they're growing and so are you. And I think that's one of the, the coolest things that we can say to our kids is like, you know what, I don't know how to navigate all this. I'm learning right alongside of you. So it's not like I'm up here telling you what to do. It's like, no, I'm coming alongside of you and I'm learning how to do this because who of us had a parenting manual for racing a tweener team? None of us, right? So we have to have so much grace towards ourselves and compassion and empathy because a lot of a lot of parenting tweens and teens, we can have shame. We have these messages that we should know. No, it's confusing. It can be totally confusing. We can try one thing and try to set a limit or a boundary and it doesn't work. And then we feel like we're failing. You know, trial and error. We're all learning and growing. So I hope that was helpful. I'm going to come over here to the page and see, see any comments that you have. Let's see. Hi. Oh, I see you. Hello. Oh, hello, Mary. Um, wish I know these strategies then. I would have just sat with him in his feelings and listened. And you know what? It's still never too late. That's the cool thing. My oldest says, Mom, you are not who you were back when I was a tween. You have grown so much. And so, and all of my kids have said that, but especially for her, because she was like the, she was my, um, really was the, was the reason that I started knowing like, wow, I have some, I have some areas in my life that I'm healing, I really need to learn and grow and change. And so she was, she was the, um, the reason that I started doing this work. And, um, and so it's never too late and our kids can see because we always have to practice listening no matter what age they are. So thank you for that. Um, hi, Cindy. Um, yeah, hello. Uh, hi, Sam. Yeah. Um, hi, Priscilla. Yeah, it takes practice. So does anybody on here have any questions that they would like me to answer? anybody have anything at all that's going on and make sure that you DM me if you have any questions and I will address them next Wednesday and I can speak to whatever it is because I love to get your questions and answer them personally and um, that's I'm here for you. So again for those of you that are on here October 5th, um, 6th and 7th at 7 p.m. Central Time. I will put it in the comments. You're welcome, Mary. So good to be with you. I love seeing you here. Um, that is when I lead the three-day free workshop, 7 to 8 p.m. Central Time. And then I usually do, it depends, but I get a lot of questions. And so I give a Q&A afterwards. And then I also ask you during that Q&A, what have you done that works? So you don't just get me to me, you also get all the other moms and they're like, you know, dealing in, well, this is what I did and this is what I did. And moms are like, thank you, thank you. This is so helpful. Tammy, my daughter thinks that anytime I talk to her, I'm yelling at her. Thank you for saying that, Tammy. Well, do you know that studies have actually been done that, and I don't know why this is, but tweens and teens, register facial expressions as anger. I don't know why, but that's what the research has shown. And, um, and so just knowing that for some reason they read it that way. Now maybe, so it would be, it would be interesting, Tammy, to say to her, um, wow, that's so interesting that you see that. And maybe you've said this to her, but that you're reading it as angry. And, and then notice, are you angry? Are you frustrated? Are you angry? Because I just had my daughter say to me, um, she gave me some really good feedback. And I was like, huh, that you're hearing it that way. What, what she, the feedback she gave ended up giving me as I realized I was being very indirect with my request and I was complaining. So I would say, ah, oh, 
there's so many dirty dishes in the dish, you know, in the sink. <laughs> and maybe not that dramatic, but I was like, oh. and she's like, mom, I feel like you're criticizing me. And I was, and I could have been like, what? I, I'm just saying there's dirty dishes. But you see, it was criticism. Because it was passive aggressive, I wasn't actually asking directly for help to do the dishes. It was coming out and then she was hearing it as you're mad at me for not doing the dishes. You see? And so sometimes, and I, it was really good because it was a blind spot. And I'm like, oh, I do do that. I do like walk in the house and I'm like, ah, oh, it's such a mess in here. So, you know, ask her, like, that's interesting um, that, you, that you perceive it that way. What is it? Is it my tone of voice? Is it maybe I'm not asking? And, and maybe nothing. It may be just that that is how she perceives it. Um, oh, also you're telling me what to do, Mary. Yes, that is, uh, you're telling me what to do. Um, <laughs> I don't know how you get around that as a mom because a lot of times we have to tell them what to do. Um, but also I'm gonna talk about that and I won't say but, sometimes they do need to be told. Um, however, sometimes we go on and on and on and we end up nagging and lecturing and going on and on and on. And we're gonna talk about that in the three-day workshop about how do we navigate that? How do we motivate our kids so we're not lecturing and nagging and writing them all the time? And then we get these power struggles and we're butting heads and ugh, it's exhausting, right? So we're gonna be talking about that. That's my nine-year-old. <laughs> that is my nine-year-old. Oh my gosh, they're such good little debaters at nine too. Um, they can be just, yeah, telling them what to do. You know what, with a nine-year-old, it's a good thing to say. If they haven't done something, it can just be say the one word. So let's say they're supposed to take out the trash. Um, rather than, will you take out the trash? You know, and we get, and we, uh, you got to take out the trash. Take out the trash. We can say trash, trash. And that way, and it's funny, they respond a lot of the time better to that because they are resistors at this age. They don't like being told what to do. And, and so that creates that butting heads as well. So anyway, thank you for being with me and have a wonderful day. And uh, again, reach out to me if you need any sort of support or you want me to answer your question next week. And I will share in the comments the three-day uh, free workshop details. It also, I'm gonna you know, be posting um, not daily, but you, you'll be seeing it pop up on the page so you can sign up for that. Um, I would love for you to come and have the opportunity to be with you, okay? Um, and I'll put the link to the anger, the anger iceberg because this is a good thing to show to your kids. Hey, look at this. You know what I just learned today? I learned that anger, a lot of times when we're angry, there's a lot of other stuff going on. You can just tell them about that. Do you ever see that? Like when you're lashing out, you're mad at me, that maybe you felt hurt or maybe you're frustrated or maybe you're feeling overwhelmed. See, getting them to recognize their different feelings. They feel overwhelmed. Oh gosh, you know, when you're overwhelmed, how might I support you? Now they might say, I don't want you to, but you're just asking the question, right? They might say, I don't want you to. And then you're like, oh, okay, that's good information. But I will put it in the comments, okay? So that you can easily access both and sign up. All right, thanks again, everybody for being with me and have a great day or evening and a great week. And I'll see you here back next Wednesday at 9 a.m. Central. All right, bye-bye.